Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? All right, on the bluff. It's time now to call to the Southern University Board of Supervisors. This is the special board meeting. We want to start off with first, close it out, then go through our regular agenda. I'm going to ask now that a uh, very talented uh, gentleman come forward, uh, Reverend Dr. Renee Brown, and uh, provide us the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Reverend Brown. Good morning. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity you've afforded us to gather together on this day and in this place. And we ask that your spirit would be in our presence, that God, the business that needs to be taken care of is done decently and in order. And more than anything else, God, you get the glory for everything that transpires on this day. We thank you for all of our university's leadership. We thank you for our governor and all who are here today. And we just ask God that you be in the midst of all of us. And we know that things will be well with our souls because you're with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Our colleague, Reverend Dr. Talbot, uh, approved that prayer. <laughs> That's right. I was about to say that ultimately we got the right one to prove it. Okay, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, who will? Oops. Who do we have? <clears throat> Join us. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is a great day. We have some special guests. We didn't need to put it on the agenda. I knew it was going to be a capacity crowd anyway. We are blessed to have this uh, young man in our presence. All of us can say some great things about him. I know Ann could say more than I could say, board member Smith. But uh, I'm going to be short with my comments because we want to afford him the opportunity to come in any manner he'd like to come in. He's been a friend to Southern University. He has gone beyond many expectations, including mine, and continues to exceed it. He finds it within his comfort level to do what's right, not what's politically expedient. It's rare to have the head of a state government to be such a person. I'm encouraged that the remaining of his tenure will probably go down as probably one of the, the most successful reigns in the history of the state of Louisiana when it comes to higher education and other matters across the state. With that being said, I hope you join me in giving our governor, John Bell Edwards, a Southern University healthy round of applause and welcome him to the podium. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chairman Lawson, uh, President Shields, you, uh, other members of the Board of Supervisors for the Southern System, um, and really everybody here. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here on a beautiful Friday morning uh, and on a beautiful campus uh, that, quite frankly, uh, is going to be a lot more beautiful when all these projects come yes, to sir. fruition that are and it's not it wasn't it wasn't even in my talking points but i have i know that in my 16 years in baton rouge i have never seen the kind of funding allocated to this system yeah. uh for improvements uh on campus uh, of all types uh including the lab school including uh all of the basic infrastructure trying to to, to make sure the bluff doesn't uh, continue to encroach on buildings, but the academic buildings, I mean, you name it. Um, and then the operational dollars too, uh, that you all have been able to enjoy. And so I, I am very pleased to be here with you this morning. And I thank you for the invitation, but more than that, I thank you for your work uh, because I know it's not easy. Uh, there is no form of public service these days that uh, is easy. So I thank all of you for, uh, your work. And I'm not going to keep you long, uh, but 
Uh, Chairman Lawson mentioned this. We we have come a really long way since 2016. Uh, Y'all know, and 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 uh, but some, I think it bears repeating because sometimes we lose sight of it. When I came into office, we were a billion dollars short to close out the year six months later. And for the fiscal year that started July 1st of 2016, we were $2 billion short. We had a grand total of $400 million in the bank. There were $850 million one-time dollars in that budget that I inherited lined up against recurring expenditures. We were in a real mess. Uh, but we've worked very hard with the legislature both then and now to right the ship. And as I stand before you, uh, the, the budget is balanced and in a very robust way. And we don't ha and not only we, do we not have a $2 billion deficit, uh, we have more than $2 billion in the bank. And later this year, that number is going to approach $3 billion. So it is time when you look at, at what we're doing in the economy, um, because we've never had, in fact, the latest numbers came out today uh, for the month of April. The unemployment measured in April has never been lower than the numbers that were reported today. The number of people employed in Louisiana has never been higher. Personal income has never been higher. We have never had the kind of robust growth in our economy with announcements of economic development projects that we have had. Um, and if you look forward into the future, the forecast is bright as, low, as far as the economists can forecast out. Uh, yesterday at the REC, the Revenue Estimating Conference, and by the way, uh, they met to figure out uh, whether there was any additional funding in the current fiscal year and if there's additional growth expected next year in state general fund. Um, and the answer was yes, uh, $323 million more uh, in the current budget year. Now, that's on top of the $900 million that was previously recognized. And then next year is $483 million more than the more than $600 million that was previously recognized. So current year excess, about $1.2 billion. And then next year's growth, about $1.1 billion. Uh, and people look forward and they say, well, you know, but you got that 0.45 sales tax that's going to go away. It is scheduled to go away. I would point out. It won't happen until after the second legislative session of the next term. So should the governor and legislature decide to keep some or all of it, they can do that. But what we found out yesterday, in fact, I've been saying this for a long time, the forecasters look at the growth that's projected. We will not be in a deficit situation when the 0.45 goes away because we have grown the economy that much over the last several years. So with everything I just told you, now is a perfect time to invest in our state, to invest in our people, to invest in the most precious natural resource that God has entrusted to us, and that's our children, and I'm talking about their education. If we don't get our teachers to the Southern Regional Average in pay this year, when are we ever going to do it? When are we going to do it? We need that $3,000 pay raise. Unfortunately, the House took that money out of the budget, but the Senate has the budget bills now, and, and I'm optimistic that they will do better. They will do right by our kids. Speaking of kids, early childhood. We put $51 million in for early childhood. They took all of that out. And you know, it isn't very long before someone who's two, three, four years old is on this campus it happens in the blink of an eye. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I came to Baton Rouge 16 years ago, the kids, the kids who are on your campus today, they were in 
early childhood if they were fortunate enough to have a seat. So, so we need to do this. And, and I can tell you if we will invest significantly and consistently in early childhood uh, and in K through 12, your mission of educating your students is going to get a lot easier. It's going to get a lot easier. Uh, and speaking of your mission, uh, unfortunately, the $57 million in growth in higher education was also removed in the House. We need that restored. Uh, and, and when we do, we will be funding higher education better than we have ever funded it. We have more need-based aid for higher education than we've ever had before. Um, so I, I'm ex excited as I, as I sit here before you um, for all of those reasons. Uh, and this idea that now is a time we ought to park hundreds of millions of dollars. By, by the way, most of it, about two thirds of it, one time money. That would be a huge mistake. It would be a huge mistake for a lot of reasons, but but just just think about it like this. Inflation is real. The first thing we have to do with the money available to us is go back and plus up the funding for last year's projects that we approved because the bids are coming in way over the estimate. There, we didn't put enough money there to actually uh, enter into a contract uh, for many of those infrastructure uh, projects. But also, uh, because of inflation, and by the way, there is no forecaster who believes the price of concrete and steel, for example, are going to go down. The rate of inflation will slow, but those projects are never going to be cheaper than they are today. You fund them now and... We'll do the right thing. Um, I know the there's uh, leadership in the Senate. I, I read the paper this morning uh, that uh, appears to be looking at this through the same lens that I'm looking at it. Um, and, and by June the 8th, it's my expectation. It's certainly my hope, but it is also my expectation. We're going to have a very good budget for the state of Louisiana. And it's also going to be a very good budget for the university, uh, Southern University system, uh, the entirety of the system, the only HBCU system in the United States of America. And so you. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the work that you're doing and the good stewards that you have been over the, the taxpayers money. Uh, and I know that you're going to continue to invest wisely and do wonderful things here uh, for the young people that you serve. And by the way, some of the people who graduate here sometimes are not so young. <laughs> that's it. That's important, too. Uh, but uh, the, the last thing I'm going to say is that uh, I really appreciate the opportunity that I have been given to serve our state as governor. It has been a challenging seven plus years. Um, but together, I believe that we have um, uh, moved this state forward and in many concrete ways, the state is better off today uh, than it was when I took office. I couldn't have done that without a lot of help from the legislature, from the people that work in my office and so forth. But that certainly includes you all. So I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And, and this is not a farewell address because I'm here till January the 8th. Uh, <laughs> and on the 9th, I'll be Ann Smith's neighbor again. Uh, in Tanchebo Parish, Louisiana. So I'm not I'm not going anywhere. We're going to work hard every single day. And there's a lot of work left uh, to be done. Uh, so my door remains open. I answer the phone. And if I don't, uh, if I'm not able, I, I'll return phone calls. Uh, so let me know what I can do to help. Uh, and, and, uh, and finally, uh, one more time, just thank you. I appreciate you all very much. God bless.
Christopher's yeah, getting a good job right now. Pass on the ball. Thank you. We are so delighted uh, that you joined us this morning. And he has been a friend throughout his tenure. Uh, invited me to lunch uh, this past uh, Monday, actually, at uh, the Capitol. And it's not uh, something that uh, is unusual. Uh, this is unusual. And uh, it's special that you're here with us today. And we're very, very grateful for uh, what you're doing and what, what you're going to continue to do. And we certainly support everything you spoke about this morning. And I'm going to put this over you and, you. and I'm glad you're the right height. I can reach you. <laughs> you have to help me back here. He's standing strategically. And so we're going to uh, give him another round of applause. For, for uh, Jump right into our next uh, special presentation. Um, I'm going to ask that uh, the person that's going to recognize this distinguished person step forward, Dr. Priestley. Would you step forward and do your presentation for us, please? Dr. Priestley, if you would, for new board members, you know, give your full name and title so they know. Yes, sir. Who you are. Thank you. Good morning, all. My name is Jacqueline Gibson Priestley, and um, I serve here at the university as the vice chancellor for enrollment and student success. And was not completely aware that I had to. Uh, introduce this person. I did re submit the information uh, as requested to Brother Renee. So if you all will allow me a moment to pull up the information that I sent to him on my computer, and then I will provide you the name of our
Fala aí. Thank you for your indulgence. Um, the person that we're going to honor today is um, individual, an individual who has served at the university for over 22 years. And during this time of service, he has represented the university at various events and activities uh, in and around the city and across the country in an effort to help us recruit our students. This person is responsible for recruiting students from across the state of Louisiana with a concentration of North Louisiana. He also has territorial responsibility for recruiting students in South Texas, Alabama, and other assigned areas. In the process of recruiting students, this man has followed a schedule of planned recruit, re recruiting events across several states. In addition, he has provided service to our unit uh, directing and leading professional development to junior recruiters and other staff. He provides collaborative input on recruitment and enrollment strategies, has been very helpful in practices of developing marketing for prospective students, and he remains proactive and robust in his communication with school counselors and stakeholders to enhance partnerships and agreements that we have here at the university. He works very closely with alumni and supporters to provide training and guidance for volunteer staff. Prior to coming to the university, he was a sports writer for the Baton Rouge Morning Advocate while working with, uh, through the grad school. Following grad school, he spent 17 years in retail as a sales associate and a customer service representative, which makes him a great recruiter for Southern University. So if you will all join me and announcing that Mr. Mark Young, admissions recruiter, is our recipient today. recognition. Uh, this is a first for me, so I've been here for a long time. I am a graduate of Southern University, 1977, undergraduate. I have a master's from here from Southern, 1982. I am a lifelong Jaguar, born and raised in Plaquemine, Louisiana, right down the river. And these 22 plus years have been rewarding and enjoyable, as well as challenging. We have all realized that we have challenges, but I am hopefully, and optimistic that going forward that we will see improvement with recruitment. Uh, we would like a little bit more support as for staffing and a little, little financing. Of course, everybody wants that. But uh, we would like to, again, thank the, the board and the university administration for its support thus far. And we hope that you will continue to support us as we travel across this state and this country looking for students to bring into this university. And again, I want to thank you for this recognition. I'm excited. This was a very, very wise choice. Those of you that don't know Mark, uh, Dr. Renee and I like to sneak around the campus at 4.30 on Fridays, and it was not unusual to see him. I expected him to be there because very little recruiting is going on at 4.30 on Friday during football season. And uh, this gentleman, and I'm telling you what I think, I'm telling you what I know, 
gets up many days at 4 a.m. in the morning. And that's what you don't see about folk that make this university uh, operate the way it does. So he is indeed deserving of the above and beyond award. And uh, let's give him another round of applause. We have an ambitious day today, but we're going to go through it uh, as expeditiously and as deliberate as we can, deliberately. Um, next, we have uh, item number five, Ms. Dottie Belletto. She's the executive director of NOCCI. She is a friend of Southern University, known her many, many years, and she works very, very tirelessly throughout the year. And what we see is the culmination of her hard work uh, uh, that she does uh, virtually every day. So, Daddy, with that being said, please come up. And I don't know if uh, our executive director, the alumni, is coming to introduce you uh, a little bit more eloquently. Uh, he'll, <laughs> he'll bring you up to have me, the, yeah. the Honorable Al Harrell. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chairman Lawson, President Shields, and members of the board. About 50 years ago, a group of university administrators, uh, elected officials, uh, executives met uh, to discuss directing resources to the students at the two historically black public colleges uh, in the state. And from that discussion uh, was uh, born uh, the Bayou Classic. It initially started off as a career fair for students and corporations to match skills and to hire our students and place them in the workforce. Uh, members of that group uh, decided that a football game would be appropriate along with that career fair. In the realm of historically black college and university classics and intercollegiate classics, the Bayou Classic is a first mover and a pace setter and has for years directed uh, sizable resources to both Grambling State University and Southern University. Uh, we've enjoyed 11 years of working with Dottie Paletto and New Orleans Convention Company Incorporated. And uh, they're going to share with you today uh, where we are now and where we project to be in the future uh, with the Bayou Classic. Thank you, Dottie. Yes, and good morning to you, uh, morning. Mr. Chairman. Thank you and your fellow board members. Thank you for having me, President Shields. I look forward to having a moment that we can explore some new opportunities at Bayou Classic. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about where we are and we're going into the 50th anniversary of Bayou Classic. What a wonderful time for you, President Shields, to be a part of this. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Uh, as we go through this, I think you'll see on your thing, we have our 50th anniversary logo, uh, which we have come out with, and this will be used as a commemorative logo for this year. This young lady right here, Brooks Benjamin, created this for us and her husband, and they are a dynamic duo who are partners with us with Bayou Classic. And so a lot of what you'll see today is their work and they'll speak a little bit further into this. This uh, logo, which should be up on the screen. Um, he wants to put it up there. Oh, sorry. Okay. Should 
little yeah, can keep technology here. But I want to I be mindful of your time today. So I'm going to continue on. And this 50th anniversary, you're going to see it's going to be all, the stadium is going to be gold across the board. And, you know, you, it works well for you guys, for sure, gold and blue, and for Grambling. So it's going to be a beautiful color for this year, for 2023. And the also, the 50th anniversary emblem is going to be used uh, for all our merchandising. And Bayou Classic has continued to grow and become more popular. Uh, you can see the logo right there in the oh, yeah. middle of it. Um, it's con continued to be more popular and to gain a lot of value. So we will be merchandising as we have not done as much last year. It's usually your bookstores, but you will see a lot more merchandising going on and it'll be going online. So Bayou Classic is going to be all over the place this year. We're going to go to the next thing because I think this is the most important thing, the net revenue. And the combination, this is a combination of sponsorship revenue, Ticketmaster sales, your tickets, and your online university ticket sales. So the numbers you see here and starting from 20, um, was it 11, going all the way down, you can see that we've doubled. Uh, we have really been working towards this for the last 10 years. We had a 10 year plan. Um, as you can see, when we, we look at uh, 2022, we're going to have to raise our graph. We're going to have to get, because we're going to go up beyond that red line that, for this year. So with your help, we'll continue for these revenue. Um, the goal is and was to give each school a million dollars, which we have done. And uh, that occurred in 2022. And our blue lines looks pretty good, too, with our net revenue here. This is historically the net revenue that was provided directly to Southern. So I'd like you to look at those. It makes perfect sense when you look at the 2018 and our 20, when we go into 2019 and then we go into pandemic. But look at that 2022. We're back up and came back up very strong, very quickly. Um, so we expect that. Again, we're going to have to raise the bar again for 2023. Our Bayou Classic attendance has, has gone along with everything, with the, the money and everything else that's going on. We've started building back up from 2019 and 2018, went through the pandemic, but we had it in Shreveport. As you all will remember, we had a game in March, so we stayed within the rules. Uh, but we're going to inching back up in 2022, and that's going to take us into the inventory of the Superdome is only about 67,000 now. We've been at 67. So they have taken some seats out, but we'll be at capacity this year for sure. We're going to blow the roof off is what we're going to do. That's my kind uh, of talk there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at this point, I wanted to go over the schedule of events quickly with you. I know most of you are aware of some of these things by Classic Press Conference. Continues, continues to grow. I wanted to show you what the presenting sponsorship dollars are for each of our ancillary events. Uh, these dollars continue to go up because revenue and, and value continues to go up. So every year we go up a little bit more. Uh, this, is a, you know, this is a great way to kick off our Bayou Classic. We'll go to the next. It's going to be Bayou Classic Thanksgiving Day. Uh, what has been determined after uh, talks with both schools and our coordinators that we have an early game time kickoff, as you're aware of, and it causes a little problem with our courts to be able to get to the parade on a Saturday before the game. So we have had the parade on Thanksgiving Day previously. We're going to go back to that for 2023. And that way it'll give our opportunity, the opportunity for our courts to ride in the parade. And this is, remember, our 50th anniversary parade. So it's going to be so much larger and it's going to be a statement about what Bayou Classic is, the state of Louisiana. And it has already brought visibility to the streets of New Orleans that people are out there and look forward to this parade now. And you will see a diverse 
group of people out there and children. So the parade is a really important part of Bayou Classic and bring us all together. So that will be on Thursday. We will have the business at Bayou. Uh, we had the career fair and um, we have worked with your group here on the campus as well for the career fair. We found the students, um, the career fairs you have on campus are so valuable and your students like the time to prepare properly before they go before a corporation that it came apparent that Bayou Classic may not be the best way to do that with their resumes, et cetera. So we created the business at Bayou, which is a little step up. It's entrepreneurs. It's all black businesses. This has grown every year since we started. This was our second year this year. Our third year, we're going up into the ballroom. Um, it's gotten so large. So these are your black businesses around the state of Louisiana that are coming in to present their business to the to our guest, as well as we're going to have an area for the students and they will have an opportunity to engage with these business leaders and those that want to be entrepreneurs and want to start businesses. As the governor, governor was saying, there is there are funds in there for starting up businesses. So we want to encourage our students to get involved. So this is a great way to have this. It'll be at the Hyatt Hotel and we'll have over 40 to 50 uh, African-American owned businesses networking in that. The Bayou Coaches Luncheon, I know you all, that is a hot ticket and everybody wants to be part of the Coaches Luncheon. This started off very small, but we have created an incredible, with your help, have created an incredible program for our both teams uh, to be given awards, et cetera, and great speakers. So this is about 650 in attendance there's not another space left in this particular program until we, unless we go to the convention center and that will be our next step perhaps. But um, we are at capacity for this one at the Hyatt Regency presenting sponsorship of 50,000 for that. Uh, I classic at Greek show and battle of the bands. Uh, we've had sold out events. Once again, inventory, they've taken seats out. So our inventory is less, but, this has been built up over the years that this is the, I mean, we're already on, tickets are on sale right now. And we have already sold I, several thousands of the VIP because we only have so much inventory. So I only have, we had 30,000 seats. I only have like 25 now, but we sell all those seats. So I had to figure out how can we up the revenue and I only have this number of seats. So we began to start taking sections and we have VIP seating in the lower levels. So I'd started it several years ago where we just took a few seats out of each section. Those went like that. They were online for, and, and in two weeks they were gone. So we added a few more seats. I don't have any risk at this. I just see how, how we're selling and I add right. more seats to it. So those seats go for $40 and they're going to go up this year for a little bit more. Our regular seats are 25. So the goal is to double that 25 entrance fee at the gate. So that's how we make more revenue, fewer seats, more revenue. You just have to keep thinking of how you can value out those seats. Uh, but we've, we've had a great thing. The presenting sponsorship of the Greek show, a hundred thousand and the battle of the bands, 175,000. And thank you, Southern. I mean, the show that you guys put on is totally amazing. And this is what our people and our guests are coming for and particularly the young people. And this is how we want to capture them and get them in the Superdome to become part of the overall Bayou classic because they are our future, right? They're our future ticket buyers. They're our future sponsors. They're our future. So we are playing to them and it's, it's working. It was, it's working. Our Bayou Classic Fan Fest uh, presenting sponsorship of 150,000. Uh, you can see the numbers. Last year we had some rain. We still had a really great show out there. And our sponsors, and I'm, I'm so happy to say right now, we did not have one sponsor that was out there and we had we had maybe over 30 
and they were fine. They were perfectly fine. They got what they needed. They got, you know, the people in their areas and we did not get one complaint. And you all remember that rain that came through on us. It was the first time in 11 years that I've ever had that happen. We have never had rain on FanFest, so we're going to do a little more, more praying this year. Wherever, yeah, yeah. wherever you are, help us out here. Because this year is going to be even larger. So this sponsorship at 150000 Um, The classic football game. Of course, this is what we all work towards, and this is, this is it. This is the epitome of what Bayou is all about. And we do want to have the education component to it. We do want to have the business component to it. And they all come together for the football game. And that's a place that we can showcase our major sponsors. And we are on NBC, as you all know. And we have structured with the help of your foundation board, Al Harrell, and being right there next to us the whole time uh, in negotiating this, which took maybe five months, six months, longer than we would have liked it to, but we got it done. And so NBC is going to be with us for a number of years and they're holding, we're not paying any production costs. Now I know you, some of your board members remember you paid a million or some of almost a million dollars in the very early days. There are no production costs. And the, what we pay is a limit of 150 that we buy our, our sponsors buy commercials directly with NBC. So are we at risk here? No. The whole idea of Bayou Classic is always to maintain no risk as much as you possibly can into the future. Uh, and we've maintained that, that mantra. That's what we go with. The presenting sponsorship value of this is a million dollars. I just want to say Southern's had 25 wins to Grambling's 24 wins. So I just want to say that this game is going to be incredible and it is always neck to neck. And you guys know it because you've been there and that field goal or that last run or that, you know, is all about the last quarter and few minutes left, left on the game. So I don't know if our hearts can take much more of that, but this year I'm expecting it to be as close as yeah. ever. And because both schools are, this is a 50th. They're going to go down in history. Who wins this game? And we're going to talk to the coaches. We're amping up the players. We're amping up the coaches. And we're amping up the entire community that this is going to be the place to be. So I have, I have no thoughts. We're going to be fine with selling out this dome, as I said. Um, the, the 50th anniversary classic and battle of the bands, a Greek show that can be at you know, buy at the website, mybodyclassic.com, Ticketmaster, and to your schools, go to your schools, to your ticket offices and buy your tickets. The tickets that are sold on campus, stay on campus. The tickets that come to the ticket office, uh, off the internet and anybody can pick up and do that. Those tickets to go directly through Ticketmaster, not on your individual campuses, that money is split between Grambling and Southern, as well as a sponsorship dollar split with Grambling and Southern. So you understand the importance of sending everyone to your campus ticket right. office. So we'll take the ticket any way that we can get it, right? So we have gone up and the ticket price is just a bit, not to any of the, the schools, the students or anything else, but the general public. Um, so we're hoping it will drive people to the ticket, the school's ticket offices, because your, your pricing will stay the same. Um, talking about who's going to put this on for us and who, who brings the dollars to the table to help us to bring more students into our program, our athletic program and school into school. This is, we want to talk about Coca-Cola. They have a multi-year commitment. Uh, their presenting sponsorship is 125,000. That is for our halftime show. Um, our halftime show, as you know, is all about the two bands. So they do an incredible job and we add some, some uh, different little wiles to it every year, just to add a little bit more of a component, but bands, Everybody stops and listens when those bands come on the field. Uh, we have a, a variety of commitments 
uh, to date, and we're looking at 1.591 million. May I let you know that we are only in what? May. And so sometimes we don't even get started until June. And um, this is the reoccurrence of relationships and partnerships that have been going on for 11 years. So our partners after Bayou Classic, Bayou Classic doesn't start in, in May or June. Bayou Classic starts right December 1st, right after in 2023. There, there is no grass growing on our feet. We have a full-time staff and we start December. Why? Because we want to make sure we want to hear what our sponsors have to, to say. We want to up it. And every year we have been able to up our values for our sponsors because of the way that they are handled at Bayou Classic. Thanks to you. If you see a sponsor, we're going to make sure you know to kind of identify them. They are so appreciative of you letting them know how much you appreciate what they're doing for the schools. And I do want to just take a minute, experience the power uh, came about. And, you know, it is all about the power of all of us coming together to make this happen. It's not just NOCCI. It's just not the both, both schools. It is the entire community that comes together. And with your help, that's going to bring it even forward more. So experience the power all of us together it takes it takes all of us to make this happen i do want to turn this real quickly over to um jeff and, and brooks and talk about how we're going to get people and tickets are on sale good morning everyone um real quick i'm just going to go through what we have been doing on social media and in our productions um, to promote but the Bayou Classic. Um, so on social media, we have, as you saw, we have unveiled the new logo, which is a metallic gold with 50 years in the middle. Uh, we really want to celebrate and get people excited about this 50th anniversary, 50 years of HBCU excellence not only on the field, but in Louisiana. Um, people are already excited on social media. Um, we, are, we have three main objectives in promoting social media content. The first, of course, is ticket sales and promoting all of the events that we have going on throughout the whole weekend. Uh, the second is engagement with our alumni, our supporters, and the HBCU community as a whole. And then the third is showcasing the impact that the Bayou Classic has had on the community and on the state of Louisiana. And that's by kind of showing testimonials and telling the Bayou Classic story and taking us back through the 50 years. So this year, we really want to go back and look at memories from the past of uh, past Bayou Classics and, and how it all started um, and tell that story because a lot of people don't know that story. Um, and so we're going to build anticipation, you know, excitement. Already people, like I said, are excited. They're commenting, they're tagging us. So we want to increase that engagement. We want the users to generate the content because when their followers see that they're excited, more people are going to become excited. And then um, we want to show behind the scenes footage um, and just let people know that we are working hard to make this event bigger and better and an epic event for you know everyone involved. And then, like I said, the user generated content. And then I'm going to have Jeff just go through. He's in charge of the video side, video production and the creative pieces that we put together. So I just want him to go through and just give you a information on, on that piece. All right, who in the room has a good Bayou Classic story? Raise your hand. Come on, come on. Everybody didn't raise their hand. Oh, I want to hear your story for sure. You put two hands up. I think I have the, the fun part of all of this. I am in charge of capturing the story. Um, with each year and each matchup brings a new story. So it is on me and my team to find that story, capture that story and communicate it to the world really via social media. Last year, we started a, a series called Tales of the Classic. If you haven't heard of it, shameless plug and promotion, go to our YouTube page, uh, Bayou Classic YouTube page um, and pull it up. What we did was we took people we took 
former student athletes from Southern and Grambling that actually played in the game and got firsthand experience uh, playing. Some even played against each other. Some played on the same team. Um, and we had a roundtable discussion on what it was like and what the experience of Bayou Classic uh, felt like uh, for those people um, that did not get a chance to play and did not get a chance to, to come, right? The whole goal is to make people want to come and visit. The whole goal is to make people uh, uh, jealous that they missed out and they want to come next year, right? Um, that That's what we're trying to do. And how we're going to do that, like Brooke said, is we're going to to document the history. 50 is a big number. Um, when you think about you know HBCU football classics, 50 – 50 is a number that's been around for a while. It's, it's a big number. And I think that we have to do something to honor that, honor that legacy and get these stories um, on tape and kind of like catalog it in a way where people will want to interact with it and it'll make them want to come. Uh, with that being said, I, y'all probably going to see me on campus or I might ask to be on campus. So when you see me, I need you to allow me the access to, you know, capture these stories. Right. Uh, because they want to know what the football team's going through leading up to the game. Right. They want to know what's going on on campus leading up to the game. You got alumni from all over the world. Um, and this is the way that we can stay in touch with them and hopefully we'll meet them at the game. Right. And that, that's, that's our goal. And that's what we're trying to do for this year. So we appreciate your time this morning. I know we we took a little bit more of it, but uh, did want, and there's so much more. Uh, PNG Procter and Gambling, our presenting sponsor. I don't want to go without saying that we're working. Our goal there is a million dollars. So a million is really the number of the day, <laughs> and uh, and then we want to put an S behind it. So it's going to be millions that we're going to be working towards. And we're not just saying it. These are not just words. You just saw it. Thank you so much. All right. Got any questions here? I think we have some questions, if you will. Yeah. And I saw uh, board member uh, Raymond Fondale hand first, and I think I saw uh, board member Christy Reeves, and I'll come on around to Dr. Tarver, and uh, we'll, say it, uh, we'll just come around after that. How's that? Uh, good morning, Ms. Uh -huh. Daddy. How are you this morning? Good. Um, um, I, I've had the pleasure of uh, being when uh, being on the board back when you were uh, given this position of promoting the Bayou Classic. And each year it's grown. We've seen since 2013, since 2014, each year has continued to grow. And I've been a part of that and watched us grow. One of the biggest draws outside of the game is the Battle of the Bands. As you know, uh, I've been there. Many in this room have been there. The room is packed. My, my question is this, what is our commitment to each one of the university's bands? Because you have a sellout crowd there. And I heard earlier that we're going to be, you know, marking the price of the tickets up a little bit more. And we already had capacity there. So my question is, what is our commitment to those bands? Because they have expenses, uniforms and all of those type of things. And I see the number of sponsors that we have and a number of commitments. I'm just asking, is there a commitment to each one of these individual bands? And that may be something I see Mr. Harrell is standing up. Yes. Uh, that's, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. The cooperative endeavor agreement between Southern University, Grambling State University, and their foundations govern how any net proceeds will be dispersed to university units. Uh, the band has uh, benefited from those net proceeds, as you saw in the schedule uh, before you, as, long as, as well as other units, as the football team, athletics, and other units. And so um, the commitment is to make sure that we have net income at the end of the game so that we can distribute those funds uh, accordingly. About five years ago, uh, we used a significant portion of the revenue from the Battle of the Bands to purchase new uniforms for the band, as well as uh, fundraising revenue that the foundation uh, set forward for. Okay, so, so that's been done before in the past. Is it a dollar amount? Uh, I know it may have been done in the past, but what are we doing moving forward as far as a commitment? Yeah, so it's not an allocated dollar amount. It's okay. based off of net income. That's why we share it on the schedule 
with you the net income from the previous years. Is it the combined net income of all the events put together? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And believe me, we appreciate them. They bring it every every year. So we are working to see what else we can do. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation and the outline of all the activities. It's great to have it this early in advance. I already put it on my calendar, so that's fabulous. Thank you. My question is real easy. Uh, how would a minority business learn more about be participating in the career fair? I have some I'd like to share that with. Thank you. Uh, we're working actually with the Chamber, the Black Chamber of Commerce, who is their foundation, which is statewide. Okay. And this is out of the Obama administration that he had started overall. There is a Black Chamber National Chamber, and that's a derivative of it. So we have a Chamber of Commerce. We're working, and I'll get that to you, Crispy, as well as to all the board members. Perfect. We appreciate you being involved with that. Thanks. Board member, uh, Dr. Carlin. Thank you very much, Ms. Pauletta. Thank you for your years of service. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> One is a follow-up to Mr. Fondell's consideration about, about the ban. When I heard the presentation about the video and interviewing uh, football players, you didn't mention anything about interviewing band members or the Dancing Dolls and that sort of thing, because they are a very important part of this not just the game itself. When you think about that separate show we do, and if you want to talk about using those things to inspire people, I think we've got to go beyond the football field. And so you should give some consideration to adding them to your list. Thank you, Dr. Targa. We will. I just the, the other thing I wanted to mention was the, uh, we have become accustomed to hearing about the fiscal impact of the Bayou Classic on uh, the economic affairs of the city of New Orleans. I've not heard anything recently about that. Uh, it would be very useful uh, if uh, we had that information uh, so we'd understand the importance of it is not just the game day activities and the revenue that comes from those uh, events, but the overall impact, uh, because that's a very important something. When we're going to the legislature to talk about funding for Southern University, you know, we won't be able to say that here is an event that has an enormous impact on the, uh, the economy of the city. So I think that would be useful to have. Thank you. And lastly, you didn't mention anything about TV. Uh, over the years, TV networks have measured our importance and the fees that we are charged by the attendance, uh, not just in the game itself, but in terms of the overall ratings, uh, do you have any information about the ratings for, for example, this past year? And yes, we do. And a comparative analysis that over the same years that you showed us about finances, if you would also put that there. Yes, I'll be glad to do that. And um, and to your point, and thank you, sir. We'll add that to the presentation. Is the reason why our sponsorships are growing because of this NBC impact and the viewers that we're receiving on that. So that's that's a real important point, and we'll add that to our overall presentation and get that to you. Thank you, and my final comment would really go to Mr. Harrell uh, as a follow-up to uh, Mr. Fondell's question. It is extremely important that the band uh, get greater attention because they're as important as the football team. I would imagine if you had a game and you didn't have the band down there, you wouldn't be talking about all this revenue and they do have needs and not just periodic needs every now and then. Uh, and so when we start talking about future negotiations uh, and that MOU and the agreement we have the universities, I'm sure both universities will be very much interested in our being able to focus and isolate on the band and that support team. Uh, and let's see how we can at least target uh, some funds uh, that we know are going to be dedicated to that purpose. And it's a broader one than transportation and the hotel fees. Correct. And that's something we should discuss in the board meeting in the future, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. That cooperative yes. endeavor agreement is up for renewal next in the next three years. Yeah. All right. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yes. yes. 
Uh, Dottie, I think, first of all, I would just like to say thank you for all of the work that you've done. I have um, been informed and I've also noticed that you have uh, taken uh, suggestions from affiliated groups or different groups that are concerned with Gramlin and Southern. And I think that's awesome. Um, such as the alums, uh, boards, you've just done it sporadically on people who you thought would give additional positive uh, comments or positive criticisms, if there is any mm -hmm. such thing, uh, fans and what have you. And I've seen a little of that results as a result of the last two or three uh, Bayou classes. So um, it appears to be additional help. And that's something that I would ask you to look into even more because um, I'm sure that you would not be able to use all of those comments. But by the time you go through all of the comments, I, I feel that it would be an asset to the Bayou Classic. Again, thank you for what you and your group do. Thank you so much. And I have to tell you, I have a ton of notes here. So, and as you said, and you know that some of the things that have been brought forward, you should have seen changes at the Bayou Classic because of those comments. So we do try to go to everyone and all your organizations to get input, um, just as we do to our sponsors. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. They, they don't go unheeded. They will be followed up on and you will get a report back on what questions were asked today. I would just like to say board members, I recognized that during the time I was chair and it did seem to help and you use some of the benefits from it. So yes, I did a very good point. Thank you. And that's yeah. why I've been here 11 years because everybody's input helps to yeah. make it even better. And that's why your revenue is going up. So thank you. Board member Paul Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Boletto, one of the things that you mentioned in your presentation was about ticket sales and uh, the importance of purchasing tickets at the university in comparison to um, Ticketmaster. So my question is really to the chairman and President Shields. Are we in the right position to make sure that um, our students, our, our faculty, our, our fans, our alumni, or a position to make it easy for them to buy tickets from the university? And are there things that we need to get done uh, from a technological, technological standpoint long term so that they're coming to the university digitally to get those tickets in comparison to Ticketmaster? I, I, I think that's an important thing to bring up. I know until recently, uh, we haven't stood up the online ability to buy our uh, tickets online. I think that's in process and should be up and available for the coming uh, academic year. Okay. Now, one of, one of the things along that line, I want to be clear, and uh, Al, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think the AD's uh, here yet. The tickets that Ticketmaster is selling, is, they're going to be a little bit more expensive than our tickets, but not necessarily as good. We're gonna have some great tickets. They're not Ticketmaster doesn't have the cream of the crop tickets. So if there's no other selling point, folk will find a way. We need to make it convenient with, uh, for our buyers out of town. I agree with that. I'm gonna work on it. But the word needs to be out. They're not getting better tickets just because they go through Ticketmaster and it's gonna cost them more. Uh, Mr. Harrell, you wanna comment on that? Then we're gonna have uh, board member uh, Dudley. To, yeah, uh, I, I think it's important to note that we have not had a ticket uh, increase in 11 years. We work with Ticketmaster and the Superdome Management Group to determine what the best model would be. And using artificial intelligence, uh, we came up with our new ticket uh, pricing structure. There will be a change on campus. The change on campus uh, for tickets that are purchased here would be about 5% less than they would be from Ticketmaster if you were to go straight to them. The uh, tickets that are sold on both campuses are the premium tickets. That's the sideline tickets. The tickets that you see that are sold on Ticketmaster are what we would consider non-premium tickets. But we have uh, shared some inventory with Ticketmaster so that they could be more competitive. 
Additionally, you've seen the revenue that increased in 2022. Most of that was from using artificial intelligence and the universities uh, being willing to share that inventory so that we could get market rate for tickets. So we're going to make sure folks are clear. Yes. You can run a ticket mask, and I see it happen all the time. <laughs> and they end up with 10-yard uh, line and end zone tickets. And we're releasing tickets that are far better. I don't think so, you have fees on your tickets. So yeah, that's, that's right. So, and so it, it, you know, and it's supporting your campus yeah. and understand that when you do have a split, it's, it's going to be a good thing because those are probably people buying tickets that are not in your particular area and going online will certainly help. So thank you. Okay. Board member Dudley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have a quick question from the business component. Um, so thank you, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I happen to have owned a business and participated in the business competition. Oh. So I want to commend you. And that was several years ago yes. when Capital One did the first big thing. Yes. So uh, North Louisiana competed and I won in that competition and came. So I, I I want to ask if there's an opportunity to w among the sponsors that you have, mm -hmm. many of the sponsors have minority vendor or minority inclusion programs for their vendor bases. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be a good opportunity to connect the businesses that are participating with those vendor programs, minority business programs within those particular sponsorships. Is there an opportunity to do that? Or have you looked at something like that just to leverage the business piece coming together with education and the platform like the value classics when you have such a large pool of minority businesses present and that may be able to grow their business within your sponsorships. And back to Ann's point, thank you for your suggestion. We have been busy building it. And so now we can get down to these additional ancillary things that yeah. can make it happen. And it was sort of a model for two years because we wanted to make sure every business person that came in there, they pay a $250, very small fee to be there. We want to keep it small, but we wanted to make sure they got value from it. And we're going to just double those numbers because everybody wants to come back and they got great value. So now this component will give it even more mm -hmm. value. Right. So we appreciate that very much. And it's a very valuable piece mm -hmm. for our corporate sponsors who want to work with these, but we have to do a better job of identifying that would exactly what you said, because they all have their vendor programs. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for everything you do. And I yeah. can't uh, close without acknowledging Ms. Bradford. And she's a good uh, friend of mine, and she works very hard and tireless uh, in supporting and making sure we contribute our sponsorships, even the small businesses. Right. So thank you and your team for all you guys do. Yes, and Tyree is still, even though she's working for the mayor of Shreveport, <laughs> right. you know, she works tirelessly with us, too. Absolutely. So, and absolutely. I have a whole heap of notes that I was supposed to go over. <laughs> so I hope I get good yeah. reports from you guys because she'll be calling. <laughs> and and I, I was leading up to something with Tyree that announced, and you got to watch board member uh, Dr. Arlanda Williams, and you have to watch board member Ann Smith and board member Fundell in particular. So that's why I'm saying this and I'm saying it publicly, and Tyree knows about it. The leadership with the Bayou Classic knows about it. Grambling president uh, knows about it, and I'm happy to hear the, the steam is gonna be laced with gold, but let him know it's gonna be tainted towards uh, <laughs> Columbia Blue and Harvest Go, okay? <laughs> I got you, I got you. But I'm good. saying this, and I hope I beat them to the punch. <laughs> We're taking Bayou Classic Show to the road. And I hope they share. I think Tyreek certainly knows. Yes. We're going to make announcements are. around the areas. And I'm going to say it public. I think Alexandria is going to be one of the first yes. cities in which they're going to come in. We're going to have tailgating. We're taking the show on, on the, the road. road. Yes. And uh, finally, uh, I'm kind of edging Dr. Williams and uh, board member emeritus chairman, uh, Ann Smith, because I'm sure uh, they may try to one-up me uh, now that they know that. But I think that's an exciting thing to do. Lay Charles needs to know about it. 
and see the folk that make it happen, uh, as well as uh, the other smaller municipalities, because this is a nationwide event. So thank, thank you, you again Chairman. for that. I want to uh, do that one, one up and uh, now more <laughs> member. One comment to Mr. Horea. Yes. Mr. A. Horea. I, I'm going to, I would be remiss if I did not say this. During the time that I was chair, we worked very cooperatively together. And I appreciate that because it tells me that I can tell him now that I think that we can gear even more tickets specifically towards Southern University alums and fans. Right. So we'd like to work with you so we can make that happen. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for all you do, Mr. Rao. All right. Thank you. Pay attention to the website. <laughs> yes. Coming soon. Stay tuned. Okay. Yes, 36 foot wrapped by your classic RVs pulling up in your city sometime soon. Isn't we'll that beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> Alexander is going to see the light. And well, guess what? Here's the other part about it we're going to showcase our programs. We're talking about a nursing school that needs to be exposed. We're talking about a law center. We're talking about New Orleans. Uh, Dr. Ammons has uh, found Alexander as a second home almost. So you're going to see this promoting our institution. That's what it's about, the academia uh, side of it. And, and, and I'm excited about that as I am uh, many other things. That's well, the away. recruitment is Dr. a very Williams. important part of it. So, so stay tuned and you craft yeah. whatever you craft for your own particular areas. But shame on us if we don't take advantage of this grand time, Dr. Williams. And, and so, you know, we have to put some teeth behind this and, and I love competition. <laughs> so it's the 50th year and I don't see why this board can't challenge Gramlin State to $50,000 in scholarships that we could raise and be presented upon uh, the Southern University side to Gramlin because we have to put our money where our mouths is. It's more than football. It's about these children. So, yes, when you come to the Bayou, we're going to have our check ready. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See you then. Now, that's a great challenge, and that's what we got to be and doing. we'll take that Let's challenge. Let's give a round of applause for that, okay? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? This is, look, everything you wanted to know, now you have an opportunity to ask, and this is a great thing to do. And uh, look out for the website. Uh, you're going to hear more uh, from our leadership team, so... Thank you so much, Dad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman okay. and your board members. Thank you. Okay. It'll be great. All right. Ambitious morning already, but we're going to move deliberately into it. But I, before we do, I want to recognize, if you stand up, uh, Mr. Carlton Jones is uh, the national president of the Alumni Association. Let's give him a round of applause for being here. We're, we're going to see much more of him next month at the retreat, and we're going to show how we're going to interact uh, with our alumni to foster their uh, – uh, development and uh, we're excited about that. Any other business need to come before the special board meeting? Hear none. Uh, consider us adjourned. We'll go directly into the academic affairs committee and ask that uh, the chair of that committee, Dr. Leon Tarver, call it to order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. President, would you roll call, please? Absolutely. Dr. Leon Tarver, the second chair. Present. Mr. Sam Gilliam, vice chair. Attorney Jody Amadi. Mrs. Maple Gaines. Mrs. Ann Smith. Dr. Orlando Williams. Mr. Myron K. Lawson. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, next item on the agenda, item four, is the adoption of the agenda. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Been so properly moved and second that we adopt the agenda. All of those in favor, let it be known by the sign of aye. Those opposed, ayes have it. The next item on the agenda is public comments. Are there any public comments with reference to agenda items for this committee at this time? Hearing none, seeing no one approach the podium, we move on to item six, action items A. Uh, request approval of bachelor's degree in computer engineering program, College of Science and Technology, issue BR. Um, who's speaking to that? Doc, Dr. Sahu? Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, um, I'm requesting your approval, review and approval of the 
uh, program bachelor's degree in computer engineering. Uh, recently, we discontinued the, compu the engineering technology program with the intent of replacing it with the com bachelor's in computer engineering. Uh, the Board of Regents uh, and all of our constituents do expect us to uh, provide programs that are more tuned to the needs of the state and also that have demand. And this is one of those programs where um, we think we will meet that need and there is demand for computer engineering. That's what engineering technology now has evolved more towards. We will be are making a commitment here. We have a thriving computer science program. We will make all efforts so that the courses in computer engineering and courses in computer science are not duplicated. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, may I ask? Uh, yes. Oh, I see. I thought he was a part of your presentation. Was he a part of your presentation? No, sir. No, sir. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> support. Okay. Uh, can we have a motion to approve uh, A? If there's no questions. A motion, motion by Mr. Gilliam, seconded by Dr. Webb Williams. All of those in favor, let it known sign of aye. Those opposed, I shall have it. The Mr. Next, Chair, yes. I just mentioned. Oh, I'm that, sorry. That's Mr. That's Mr. Pegs, Pegas, who graduated last uh, week in electrical engineering and has joined our staff here. So that's who he is. Uh, <laughs> make sure he signs a check I, correctly, okay? <laughs> I thought he was about to testify on something. Okay, we may go on now to action item six. Uh, B, C, and D. Uh, Mr. Gilliam? I, I can't hear you, Mr. Just I'm on. Okay. okay, Mr. Chairman, I would like to offer a motion to approve in global items B, uh, C, with the exception of C1, and um, item D. Uh, do I have something second of the motion? Second. Dr. Williams? It's been moved and seconded that we approve in global items B, C, and D minus C1. All in those in favor, let it know in sign of aye. Aye. As opposed, ayes have it. Thank you very much. And we move on now to item seven, informational items, 7A, academic affairs, curriculum discussion. Uh, who will make that presentation, Dr. Sahu? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman of... Um, and Mr. President, um, we have been working for the last two to three years on enhancing our capacity to provide more advanced degrees at Southern University Baton Rouge campus. And as a research to Carnegie Institution, and the best way to maintain that and grow that status is to enhance our capacity to provide uh, more market-oriented doctoral programs. And this initiative of providing a site D doctoral program is a practitioner-oriented program uh, that will be housed in the Nelson Mandela College. Uh, that's where the Department of Psychology is. We try to do it as a PhD in terms of the faculty wanting to do it that way, but there is more demand and there is more you know, market-oriented and doing the right thing in terms of providing capacity opportunity for uh, the practitioners to enhance their capacity to be practitioner scholars. And that's what this, uh, there is a great need in Louisiana. And we already have done some groundwork. We have support from the accrediting agency, the American Psychological Association. It'll be a low residency. I was a little ambitious, tried to do it in two years, probably even though that was our intent, probably it'll be a little longer. Uh, so the participants will be in the executive style, the way we do it already, executive PhD program, but it'll have a lot more rigor um, and we'll also have more clinical uh, you know, space uh, for the practitioners and they will be doing more project and if they want to do a research uh, based and they will have that opportunity too. Um, so, but the immediate need is to engage some consultants who have 
knowledge and can assist us to do it right in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the tenure of the program, in terms of participant group that we will be addressing or will be approaching and also meeting the specialized accreditation needs, both for the APA and for SAC COC. Um, we need to recruit uh, at least certainly a dedicated uh, program coordinator for this and, 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 and one more additional faculty, but this will draw a lot more practitioners and not be relying so much on the faculty that we have now. It will be a mix of both. And then Nelson Mandela College, based on the expansion that we are seeing, does need uh, infrastructure investment. We don't have the furniture is antiquated. And to, this is a very ambitious thing, right thing, but we have some infrastructure needs. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any comments or questions of Dr. Sahu in reference to this information item? Mrs. Gilliam? And I don't want to put you on the spot because I've got about four or five questions yes, that are very specific. But if I, I, I would ask yes, sir. consideration, um, will we be, will there be implications for additional funds that would be needed? Don't have to answer now, just give consideration. Uh, are we going to, well, you just indicated we're going to need some additional facilities. Yes. Um, we're going to need possibly a significant increase in faculty. We will need uh, two faculty members. We have a need in the psychology department already. And so, but in terms of dedicated faculty, we at least need one dedicated faculty to this program. That will be recurring money. But our expectation is since it will be an executive program, it will be self-sustaining. And that will be a revenue sharing model that will be with the university, with the department, uh, with the college, um, and also operational cost. There will be no need for additional recurring money other than the initial investment. Okay. Another consideration from the second to the last is what would possibly be the projected enrollment? And these are some of the same questions that I know we're going to be asked if we carry this forward to the Board of Regents. And last, of course, Will there be any added condi uh, conditions for accreditation? Uh, we will not. All the participants um, and all the faculty uh, leaders and program participants in terms of providing intellectual leadership will all be academically appropriately academically qualified. Um, th there will be no loss of rigor in terms of providing this course. That's why I did a little more research sir, with the program that has Site D. Uh, they don't do it in two years. You probably have to expand it. I'll have to do a little more research. And then that's why we need consultants. But we will be very mindful that we are satisfying both SAC COC and the American Psychological Association accreditation requirements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other further questions, comments? Comment I want to speak to the medical research? school. You have school. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, given the last board meeting where uh, Dr. Andrews came forward from the, the, the black physicians in this area and the support that he has for that, obviously, Vice Chair um, uh, Dr. Ronnie Whitfield's uh, interest in this, and I think uh, there is a need for a medical school in Baton Rouge, uh, but also accepting the fact that this... <laughs> Making that happen is a is a, a, a very significant undertaking. I wanted to inform the board. My initial plans moving forward would would be with the additional recurring uh, dollars that the state is hopefully going to approve in this budget cycle to hire somebody full time to actually move that forward. Um, and I, I I know someone uh, has been highly recommended. Is really well connected least try to talk that person on board to do that but uh, all of the different players the healthcare providers the accreditors the all of that that's going to take somebody paying attention to that full time and so hopefully by this fall we'll have somebody on board that that can um, serve as the project manager on that thank you any other further comments i, I just wanted to uh Chairman? Firstly, of this program, it's needed. 
if we're trying to address the trends in the communities, which is to be proactive in dealing with uh, the challenges that many folk have, younger and older, this is where we should be going. So thank you for that. Uh, the other piece is there's millions of dollars out there to assist with this. And I think it's prudent for this president to utilize specialized service to make this happen and happen uh, as, a, uh, as swiftly as possible. So uh, kudos, this is an emerging uh, degree for many HBCUs. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can really set the bar for it. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any further comments? If not, we go to item nine. Other business? Is there any other business before this one, committee? One other thing, time? I want to make sure we kind of clean it up a little bit uh, on the item uh, that I think we amended. We, uh, we we modified it, but we may need to go ahead and just modify the agenda a little bit more in detail, uh, if you will, uh, attorney. And I, I, y'all took them all up in Globo with the exception of item C1. Yes. And so you need to make a motion on item C1 to just table it until the next meeting because you yeah. approved the entirety of the agenda with that item. And then you took up B, C, and D in Globo without C1. So you still need to take some some measure of We have such a motion, Mr. Gilliam? To table it till next meeting. To, that's to table C1. Well, lay it over a table, do the same thing. Lay it over will probably uh, lay it over at this fine. point. Uh, it just needs to be a just, How about we just remove it? From the agenda? Can I make a move just to remove it? You would need to go back and amend the agenda at that point to remove it. But yeah. Okay. So what is the recommendation? I can't hear it. I'm, I'm sorry. So it, let's table it then at this point. Ta table it would be the procedural let's, device. Let's, for let's right table now. it, if okay. you will. So move then, Mr. Chair, that... Uh, all right. Item would that be C one would be tables. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Is there a second to that motion? Who's on the committee? Ms. Ms. Smith, Ms. Williams. Oh, Dr. Williams. Okay. Then properly moves and second that be table C one. All those in favor, that on sign of aye. Aye. Thank you. Is there any other further action, uh, Mr. DeQueer, we need to take in reference to that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on now and seeing there's no other business before the committee, uh, I'm in a motion to adjoin. Dr. Williams, second by Ms. Smith, then properly moved and seconded. So moved. We adjoin, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Now it's time for facility. And uh, property committee, actually, the chair of that committee, uh, Attorney Edwin Shorty, uh, call it to order. Thank you, sir. The facilities and property committee are called to order. Roll call, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Attorney Edwin Shorty, chair. Present. Attorney Des Moines Rutledge, vice chair. Mr. Paul Matthews. Present. Mrs. Ann Smith. Present. Dr. Leon Tarver II. Yes. Dr. Ron Ronnie Whitfield. Mr. Myron K. Lawson. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, sir. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved and properly seconded. The uh, agenda is adopted. Are there any public comments? Any public comments? Seeing none, we will move on to our informational items. Informational item 5A, facilities update. Mr. Dawson. Uh, Chairman Shorty and to the facility committee and to President Shields and Chairman Lawson and this illustrious uh, Board of Supervisors. I'm glad to uh, just kind of give a brief update on where we're going and what has been happening in facilities. Uh, once a month, we have a meeting with FPNC um, to discuss all the items that's going on throughout all the projects throughout the entire system. Uh, we had a meeting um, this, this week. What is F? Oh, F, Facility Planning and Control Division of Administration. Of the state of Louisiana. Of the state of Louisiana. That's right. We got some new board members. That's right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, um, we have a meeting with them. And um, I tell you what, I'm very happy to say, as the governor mentioned, about the number of projects we have going on as on Baton Rouge campus and other, other campuses. 
in county, we have about 18 projects that we have going on at Baton Rouge campuses. And that is HERF projects, that's capital outlay projects, deferred maintenance projects. I mean, we have quite quite a, a bit. And in the chart that I provided for you, it indicates um, where we are. We are still going through design on, on a number of those projects. We're getting through to a point that we will have um, um, construction documents coming out on some of the hurry projects very, very soon. The goal is, is that then we're crossing our fingers, barring any issues with FPNC and some of the designers that we may be breaking ground on some of the projects before the end, end of the year. But I can tell you that it is a continued effort to make sure that those things are done and they're carried forward. Another thing that I want to mention is that there is a new director of facility planning control who visited the campus this week. I had a chance to have a meeting with them along with uh, me and uh, and Mr. Mon Whitmore and uh, as well as um, um, Mr. McClinton. We met with him. Uh, he came in to kind of talk a little bit about um, some of the things that he recommended that we were doing. After a brief discussion, he realized that we were already doing those things. So, so uh, he said, well, my meeting will be cut short. We had a chance to drive him around the campus. We had a chance for him to see all the projects here. We are planning another trip into uh, to um, Shreveport so he can see all the projects there and then also have a, a, a trip down to New Orleans. So the goal is, is to make sure that the new director of facility planning control understand what our needs are, what we're looking at, what we're doing, and, um, and what we need to continue to have the projects move forward without having an issue. Another thing I want to say that all our deferred maintenance projects are encumbered. I mean, one thing that the state does is that they offer money uh, from uh, our Board of Regents to say that you have X number of dollars for deferred maintenance. Seven million dollars were given to the university last year. All those dollars are encumbered in projects that are moving forward. I had a meeting with uh, Board of Regents um, this week, uh, contact, and even those projects that come under budget, the goal is to immediately identify the additional dollars that we have left and immediately put them toward projects. So the goal is to hope that we have additional funding coming in this session. I can tell you that some of the initial information a little bit disappointing. Fifty million dollars was were applied to higher ed last year for the entire higher ed, which we got seven. This year, that budget has been is at twenty five. So think about deferred maintenance budget at 25 and, and President Shields, we were at meetings and uh, we were at a meeting um, um, this week talking about the need for deferred maintenance. And as uh, the governor says that the House is having some different ideas, but the Senate seems to have some support in supporting what we what we need along those along those particular uh, particular lines. Um, just one other thing I want to say that we had a meeting with and I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Harrell was at the meeting. Uh, Mr. McClain was at the meeting discussing some projects. There is a, a goal to change the codes and that's being presented to our legislator. That's going to change some of the building codes. One of our designers said that could increase a project from 15 to 20 percent. Now, of course, if you increase a project 15 percent, uh, 20 percent without the initial funding. That's going to be pretty inter interesting on how we do it. And a lot of times they say, well, we start doing valued engineering. That's a term that scares me a little bit when you start saying valued engineering, because that means that you'd be cutting things out of project in order to make it happen. We have to continue to see where that lands and what we need to do uh, um, um, to make sure that um, we, we land on, on a positive area associated with that. You know, HB2 at this particular point, there's nothing significant that has happened legislatively that has affected our projects. Our projects still look um, 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 pretty substantial, pretty good in HB2. So uh, as we move forward with the process and we continue to monitor it, we'll make sure that, that we keep you informed. But um, if there are any questions about the further process of what goes next, we have our capital project coordinator here, uh, Mr. Simone Whitmore, if you have any questions along, along those levels. So uh, that's my brief update. I appreciate your indulgence last week because we had the uh, Baton Rouge here. <laughs> I know um, Ms. Smith <laughs> was absent, but uh, uh, it was a presentation dealing with Hardin Boulevard, and we'll continue to coordinate with all of our necessary agencies to make sure we're successful. So with that, um, that ends, uh, Mr. Chair, that ends my uh, update. Any other business for the facilities and uh, property committee? Any other business? Seeing none, before I entertain a motion to adjourn, just to let the chairman know, we were, we were having a bit of a, a side conversation, uh, which piggybacked off a conversation we had last night about the, the board packet and being able to tab through it. Well, it seems depending on the type of device you you access it from, you, you can do 
what we were talking about. So Tracy was able to pull it up from from the website directly, and it's done where you can. But pulling it up from the iPad, you can't. So they're working through that. Hopefully, we'll have an update shortly on how we figure that out. Thank you for that. I, I think that's the it's a difference between a desktop and and the iPad functionality. We can't do it on the desktop. I don't know. I don't know if we. <laughs> the question was whether or not we could do it from the desktop, and I don't know. It's it's more of an iPad. The website, issue. you can't. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. We've got a question. I have no idea. Hi, Chairman Shorty. Excuse me, past chairman. Hi, Chairman Dawson. Our, our SULC uh, candidate for graduation. Yes, ma'am. My question for facilities always is concerning lighting and parking. Did anything change? Hey, you're right there. A, a project that um, that we're looking at for lighting that's going to really help. I don't want to be too uh, forthcoming yet because it's still in the process, and it's a grant that's going to really assist a lot of lighting on the campus. Not only as far as providing increased lighting for safety, but also reducing costs. So that project is a grant going forward. So that's um, that's that's moving. We have had discussions with entities about uh, having multi-level parking. Those conversations are still being discussed, and we had two or three meetings to discuss having multi-level parking structures on campus. So as that progresses, you know, we'll we'll let you know. It's still in the emphasis stages, talking about funding and how how that can be accomplished. So the time frame is probably like years to come. Oh, it's it's going to be a few. <laughs> yes. Okay, I just wanted to know. Yeah, and congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations on your uh, impending graduation. I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, Chancellor Pierre has uh, checked to make sure. Did she, did she meet all the requirements? Yes, she did. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe I've, Mr. Matthews has made a motion to adjourn. It has been seconded by Dr. Tarver. We are adjourned. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. We'll go directly into the Finance Committee and ask that the chair of that committee, uh, Dr. Arlanda Williams, uh, call it to order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to call the Finance Committee to order. May I have a roll call, Mr. President? Absolutely. Dr. Arlanda Williams, Present. chair. Mrs. Ann Smith, vice chair. Present. Mr. Sam Gilliam. Present. Mrs. Christy Reeves. Present. Attorney Des Moines Rutledge. Dr. Leon Tarver II. Present. Mr. Myron K. Lawson. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Moved Move by Mr. Gilliam. Second by Ms. Dr. Tarver. All those in favor? Motion passes. Are there any public comments? Seeing none. Item five. A request approval of a $500 per semester bar prep fee for the incoming law students. Yes. Year. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, as I've outlined in, in, in the letter to the board, um, there are a lot of things that are happening with respect to bar examinations, the American Bar Association, and uh, challenges that we have seen with respect to our students. One is, especially during the COVID period, which I just simply say it's, it's coming to an end. Uh, we had a lot of students that struggle with the financing of the bar prep. And we worked out lots of deals with bar prep groups, uh, trying to reduce the cost, still challenges. Uh, this is something we actually wanted to do three or four years ago because we saw this challenge coming in that um, it's very difficult for students to have the money needed at the end of the process to have all those costs covered. This is extremely difficult. The other thing that's driving this discussion is there's something new coming out called Next Gen Bar, Next Generation Bar. We don't even know what that really looks like, uh, but it's coming. And there are all kinds of surveys. We have to figure out what does that do with respect to changes in the curriculum, how we prepare students for the bar examination. 
there's a big discussion with the American Bar Association right now with respect to um, the whole issue of how does this affect schools with respect to the ABA's requirement that the uh, cohort group uh, achieve a 75% pass rate. More troubling in most, most recently is the fact that the ABA just reported that only 57% of African Americans passed the bar exam on this last round. So what does that mean? Well, we have historically been, and this is true of the HBCU law schools, we have historically been the schools that have produced black lawyers. So imagine this, only six of the 200 ABA accredited law schools are, a, are HBCU law schools. That means we represent only 3% of the ABA law schools, but we produce 25% of the African-American lawyers. In addition, the greatest risk with respect to the meeting the standard falls upon schools that are, have access and opportunity as their mission to provide access and opportunity for African Americans and, and, and particularly Latino lawyers. So we know the challenges that, that are coming forward and we have to be very vigilant to make sure we're prepared for that. And so with this incoming class, because next gen bar, we anticipate to begin in 2026, which means that this incoming class of 2023 is gonna be facing next generation bar. We have to do everything possible to store away funds and resources so that they will have all the resources they need to be prepared for that bar. And, and, and that is the reason why we want to have that for incoming law students because we got to be ready. We can't wait until that time comes and find ourselves short on resources. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yeah. Chancellor, rather. Yeah. So, in other words, the incoming cohort yes. that's coming in will be the first students that will be, um, will have to pay this fee. Exactly. So we're preparing them for the 26 new Gen X that's coming up. That's right. We don't know what it is, but we know it. Probably not. It's more trendy to think, and we're preparing them for it. Yes, yes, they're they're going to be the first group that is going to face that. So, for example, the students that are in school right now, they don't have to worry about next generation bar. That's not on the horizon. The, the interesting thing is that we've seen the iteration of the bar change because when COVID was in effect, different states reduced the number of days the bar was going to be given kind of uh, even reduce the number of subjects that were being tested and so forth and so on. Well, now they've come back with a vengeance. And you, you have seen bar passes rates plummet state by state. In fact, in California, for example, less than one third of all bar takers who took the bar exam in California passed the bar exam. In Florida, it was like right at 50%. So, so we're seeing these numbers and because we know our students are going all over the country, okay, we have to figure out a way to be prepared for that, for that, because one of the challenges is going to be a resource challenge. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chancellor. It just looks like it makes a good sense, great insight. In fact, Madam Chair, I'd like to move for approval of uh, 5A, and if it pleases the committee, uh, in global 5A, B, C, and D. Ms. Foster, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? There is a second, Ms. Foster. So am I allowed to have discussion on the motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Chancellor. Hi, how you doing? Good. So I have a question about um, 5B. So why are out-of-state fees increasing for non-resident law students and not even-handedly with in-state law students as well, and by how much? Well, number one, the state of Louisiana regulates tuition. Uh, the legislature approves tuition. I don't have the authority. I don't think the board has the authority to increase tuition as such for in-state students. 
The second reason is this. There has not been an increase in out-of-state fees for approximately nine years, since the end of the general administration. And you may remember, for those board members who have been on the board, were on the board at that time, there was something called the GRAD Act. And the GRAD Act <laughs> had a feature that out-of-state fees went up $1,000 per year, every year. And so when the GRAD Act ended, that ended. So actually, we have not kept up with the times. In other words, had that reality come, right now, out-of-state fees are $12,600 per year. The out-of-state fee would be approximately $20,000, roughly $20,600. Now, that seems to be maybe a big number, but consider this. In many states, the out-of-state fee is either equal or twice the in-state fee. And, and we ran the numbers compared to what... So in that letter that I submitted to the board, I said, this is what the cost would be for out-of-state fees for students if we approve this particular fee increase. And I ran some numbers compared to uh, law schools like Texas Southern, LSU, and other, other law schools. And only with this increase are we even close and beginning to approach close to what students are paying now. So Louisiana has been for good reason, a place where out-of-state students have come because the out-of-state fee has been very, very reasonable. This number hasn't increased in like eight or nine, well, nine years for sure. And so it is a, it's a time for us to start adjusting that. Plus the reality is, is that um, we just had the governor come and present to us. The governor has been very generous in his executive budgets to higher education, okay? We don't know who's gonna be the next governor and we don't know what a generosity is going to be if there's gonna be generosity. The, the, the third thing I wanna point out is that given this lack of increase over time, that it's time for us to really start dealing with the realities because at the end of the day, we still have to produce a lot of self-generated funds to operate our campuses and this is the the one way that we're allowed to do it by law without having to go to the legislature and and i think in an election year i don't think you're going to get anybody to vote for an increase in tuition on in state plus and i looked at our numbers of the 975 applicants we have right now 650 of them are from outside the state of louisiana so students are willing to pay. Uh, is it a burden? Yes, it can be an extra burden. That is why I did not want to impose it on our students that are here now. But for the future, and then the, for everybody that's coming forward knows what the reset of costs were going to be for our institution as a our non-resident student. Yes, ma'am. So this cost will come into effect with the new cohort who graduates in 2026? Exactly. So I definitely agree with you. So you're saying that this cost is determined by the legislator or the law center is doing that outside no, of that? No, this non-resident fee is, a le is the Louisiana, not, not the Louisiana legislature. This is the law center saying we need to look at our self-generated funds. We have a responsibility to make sure that we have self-generated funds in order to do the things that we need to do. The other part of it that's really significant is that um, when we look at our in-state pool, our in-state pool is willowing away. Um, and I think I provided the board with stats on <laughs> at, at the board retreat at, at the number of applicants we have. I, you know, I don't know if we could sustain a law school, if we only relied on in-state residents. I, it, it, well, it'd be a much smaller law. It'd be, the, it'd be the small law school that folks who haven't been around here for a while remember. It, it, it just is. 
So the reality is we've become uh, a good place for non-resident students to come because we're providing opportunities that we have learned that even schools in their state are not providing. And they are, in many cases, returning back to those states uh, in, a, in a better position than they could have ever been. But the challenge is we've got to balance that out. We've got to figure out how to make that work. And I think with this incoming cohort, this is where we can start. We may find that we may not need to do this anymore, but I suspect we're gonna find that we're gonna continue to have to do this if this trend continues. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I understand the reasoning or the rationale behind it. Just speaking as a current student who was an out-of-state student who decided to make Louisiana my home, the concerns for the law students financially are severe. And so you've seen this up close, of course. And so obviously I speak for my constituents and I just want to make sure that, you know, I know you will because I'm graduating, but I'll still be around because um, why would I leave you? Just the considerations of just thinking about how people are, the refund check ends very early, you know? Oh, so I, I totally agree. Look, and just look. to be frank about it, you know? So those concerns, law school was very expensive, even if we are financially, you know, affordable, I guess. For in comparison to other schools. So thank you for explaining it. I just, if I see it, I'm going to ask a question about it because it's very to. pertinent. You're, so. supp you're supposed to. Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Foster brought up a good point. And I, I just want to make sure we're clear. I think it was last year you told us that Southern University Law School was a value compared to other state schools and other schools throughout the South or the nation? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the reason for you raising your fees is because of the demand for people from out of state that are coming in and the number of students in the state of Louisiana applying for law school has dwindled. So you're doing this as a result of demand and increased expenses that you foresee coming up? Well, not only, but not only increased expenses. So here's what I, I think. And I, so I'm going to give you a little inside baseball on this. So we're, we're able to find talented law students that other states are missing out on. And here's what I mean by that. They're looking purely, and I don't need to explain this to the president because he knows all about this. They're looking purely at an LSAT number. But there's more to a great law student than an LSAT number. So, so we dig deep in looking at the background, and, 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 I, and I'm going to, for purposes of this discussion, Ms. Foster is an example. And I use that, Ms. Foster, because when, before Ms. Foster came to law school, Ms. Foster had worked at some of the biggest law firms in America and had gained the kind of experience that she used to try to hide in the back of the class and the basis of a procedure. And I would call her and ask her some of those questions because I looked at her resume and I knew she had real world experience in this particular thing. Okay. Now, somebody missed out on that talent. And we have cases like that over and over and over again. And at the same time, we're supporting students at, at an extraordinary level with competitions, with all kinds of things that when we show up, people are say, wow, where, where, where are these students coming from? Now, we, we probably, and I'll say this because I heard a discussion about HERF, we probably may not have needed to increase this had we socked away more money for HERF. But what we did with the HERF money is we invested over $6 million in students with HERF money during COVID. Well over, it's like over 60 something percent of the money we got, we invested in students. So another reason is we're not going to have that HERF money to, to, to put aside. I mean, you know, our students went to a lot of places. They got a lot of experience. They got a lot of experiential opportunities. And we have to figure out how we're going to 
continue to provide that level of service and opportunity, but it's going to be on our dime now. Right, thank, thank you, Justin. All right, there's a motion and a second on the floor. All those, in, I'm sorry, Doctor. Yeah, I've um, had it for a while. Tarver. Yeah, I just had one other comment to make about this this whole analysis. Quite frankly, if you listen to the data points that he's been making, it tells us that on the basis that we are now operating, we won't be continuing to operate at the same cost level. I look, for example, when we were trying to attract faculty members to the law school outside of this area, the cost of doing so coming competitively from other states was greater than it was here in Louisiana, the whole business of our students. So if you want to continue for the future, we're going to have to make sure that we can leverage opportunity. And that's in essence what they're saying. I, I wouldn't rely. I wouldn't rely as much upon some of the analysis as, as the cost factor. And I think we have to make sure those things are equal to each other. And if you're going to have a dwindling pool of students from inside this state, then you're going to have to have a larger pool outside of this state. And the cost for that technology, faculty costs, student costs, all of that's going to go up. Those things have to be considered. And that's why I was in support of that and moved the previous question. Yes, sir. Ms. Foster. I'm sorry. I just have one more question. What is the actual quantity of how much is it going to increase by like what percentage? Well, like, can you just tell me the number? Uh, it's about it's about a three percent increase in the total. In other words, when you combine the in-state and out-of-state fee. Uh, now, the the if you just take the out-of-state fee, for example, which is now twelve thousand six hundred, it's about a seven percent on the out-of-state fee. But in terms of the total cost, it's about a three percent increase. Okay, thank you. I don't have any more questions. Seeing no further questions, um, there's a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion passes. <laughs> item six, um, informational items. Your inter your in interim financial reports are in your packet. Is there any other business to come before this committee? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Ms. Reeves, second by Mr. Gillum. All those in favor? Any opposed? We stand at Thank you, uh, Chair Lady. Uh, we'll go directly to the Governor's Committee, uh, chaired by uh, Reverend Dr. Samuel Talbert. If you will, call your uh, committee to order, Dr. Talbert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I will call the Governor's Committee to order. And at this time, roll call, please. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Samuel Talbert, Chair. Present. Dr. Randy Whitfield, Vice Chair. Ms. Nadia Foster. Present. Ms. Christy Reeves. Present. Attorney Edwin Shorty. Present. Dr. Leon Tarver, II. Second. Uh, Chair, Mr. Myron Lawson. Present. So we do have a quorum. I'm sorry. Yes, you do have a Yeah, thank you very much. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion for the adoption of the agenda. Second. Moved by Mr. Shorty and second by Ms. Reeves. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, vote by saying aye. Any opposed, the ayes have it. Our agenda is approved. Are there any public comments at this time? If not, we will move to action item number five. Uh, 5A, request approval of the records management policy. Uh, well, she moved to approve, all right. There's been moved and second. Any discussion? Well, I was going to uh, ask the president to give us a briefing on it. Our general counsel can speak to what's going on okay. here. Uh, yes, this is a uh, an updated policy that was originally done in 2019. It is just um, a uniform policy for the system as it relates to record retention, and it will require for each campus to have a, uh, an officer so we can keep track of, of the type of records and, and how we save and dispose of them in accordance with our policy. Does that answer your question? All right, with no further discussion, all in favor, vote by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the ayes have it, the item is approved. Any other business before the governor's committee? If not, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll move directly into the Personnel and Affairs Committee. 
uh, we're going to ask that the chair of that committee, uh, Mr. Samuel uh, Gilliam, take charge of that committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The personnel committee is here by call to order. Uh, Mr. President, will you please give us a roll call? Absolutely. Mr. Sam Gilliam, President. Chair. Mrs. Christy Reeves, Vice Chair. Here. Attorney Jody Amadi. Ms. Zazel Dudley. Here. Dr. Leon Tarver II. Here. Dr. Orlando Williams. Present. Mr. Myron K. Lawson. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the next item, uh, is number three, uh, adoption of the agenda, but we would uh, focus your attention the wording, there is a change in the wording in item number I to read thus, request approval at the discretion of newly appointed Chancellor Aubrey Gant to extend interim appointments for up to six months. And this is from the Susla campus. The staff, all of that, that's a little mouthful. <clears throat> Say that again. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, to read, request approval at the discretion of okay. the newly appointed Chancellor Aubrey Gant to extend interim appointments for up to six months. And this is specific to the Shreveport campus. Put it together? Okay. They're in. Okay. <coughs> we'll, yes, sir. We'll move for an adoption of uh, most of them. It's been moved by Dr. Williams and second by um, um, Ms. Reed. I guess. Okay. I guess my my question up. is, maybe it's just a clarity. We're saying that the new chancellor would be able to extend positions for up to six months. Six months. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is totally in her discretion. More of course. Well, we're in conversations. I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of this so that she has a chance to come in, see what's going on and decide. I, I, I don't want those folks, right now their appointments end July 1, June 30th, and and almost the whole senior team are interim. And so they need the, the space to, for her to okay. come on the ground and do that. Okay. okay. I've been in conversations with her. Okay. okay. Good, I have a motion and a second for approval of the uh, adoption of the agenda. Those in favor, please let everybody know on the side of aye. Aye. Opposed is nay. Hearing none, the adoption of the agenda as amended. Uh, we move to item number four, public comments. Are there any public comments relative to any item on the Personnel Affairs Committee? Seeing no one appro approach, we go into um, the action items. We have action items five through, I believe it is well, all the way through. I. Uh, what is the pleasure of this committee? Okay, it's been moved in global and second by Dr. Tarra that we would approve these action items, uh, action items five through A through I. Those in favor, please be done by no by side of I. Yes, we have Dr. We have a question, Mr. So Boston. Thank you. Please. It's I'm I don't have I just have a question. Chancellor Pierre. Um, can you explain uh, five, well, it's it's B, subsection six and eight, Christopher Turner and Ebony, Ebony Woodruff. What are those positions? Let me see. It's, it's, yes. So with respect to Mr. Turner, so um, we created uh, about three, four, four years ago, Mixed Reality Virtual Innovation Gaming and Esports Institute. And the idea behind the Institute was to um, look at e-gaming, e-sports, and all of those related virtual reality uh, up and coming industries and realizing that there was an intellectual property a licensing side and a whole bunch of things that related to legal <laughs> requirements. And we thought this would be a great way to get our students involved in this mm -hmm. um, to essentially give us a working model, an institute that dealt with all of these kinds of things. As time 
developed, we found out there were industry partners that were interested in this, Microsoft and a number of them. So we actually developed and we invested a little bit. We got some support, an esports lab, an e-gaming lab. Who you're talking about on the on SUBR? And that is okay. actually it's physically located in the um, student union. Yeah, that's so. This is what this is. Yes. Okay, I have no further questions. I just didn't know the acronym. Thank you. All right. Thank Good. You, Ms. That, any further questions, Ms. Foss? And, and okay, fact, we've, we've got it. Chance. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. This item, these items, have been moved and uh, adopted. Those in favor, please let me know by sign of aye. Opposed, nay. These items are thus adopted. Item number six is other business. Is there any other business to come before the personnel affairs committee? Hearing none, we move to item number seven, adjournment. What is your pleasure? We move by Dr. Williams and on the committee. And second by excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Reed. And second by Ms. Reed. Uh, the personal affairs committee is thus adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your tolerance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll go directly into the Southern University Board of Supervisors meetings now to call it order. Uh, item number uh, two is roll call. Mr. Secretary. Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Myron K. Lawson, Chair. Present. Dr. Ronnie Whitfield, Vice Chair. Attorney Jody Amady. Ms. Azell Dudley. Mr. Raymond Fondell, Jr. Ms. Nadia Foster. Mrs. Maple Gaines. Mr. Sam Gilliam. Present. Mr. Paul Matthews. Present. Mrs. Christy Reeves. Here. Attorney Des Moines Rutledge. Attorney Edwin Shorty. Present. Mrs. Ann A. Smith. Present. Dr. Leon R. Tarver II. Here. Reverend Dr. Samuel Tolbert. Here. And Dr. Orlando Williams. Right. Right. I take it that's a quorum that that's we have a quorum. Been. Okay. Item number three is adoption of the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda as printed? Hearing none, we have a motion to uh, approve the agenda by Dr. Tarver, properly seconded by Board Member Matthews. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor, aye. Opposed, the motion carries. Item number four, any public comments relative to the adopted agenda as printed? Any cards? Seeing one approach the podium. Uh, we'll go to item number five, action item. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I'd like to move to both approve items 5A through E. It's been properly moved by Dr. Talbot, second by board member uh, Fondell. Uh, what's your pleasure? Any question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose that motion carries. Item number seven, resolutions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <sighs> we start with. Uh, Janice Ray Anderson Williams received her bachelor's and master's degree from Southern University. During her matriculation at Southern University, she served as associate feature editor of the Southern Digest. For many years, she served as an adjunct constructor of oral facial disorders in the Southern University Special Education Department. She was a life member of Mu Zeta chapter of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, an associate member of Jack and Jill of America, and a life member of Southern University Alumni Federation. She was also the wife of former Chancellor Leaudrey Williams. She passed away on May 4th, 2023. Mr. Bronson Pete was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana and later moved to Houston, Texas. He will be remembered as a loving and lighthearted spirit by those who knew him well. He was the grandson of the late former president Dolores Spikes he passed away on February 23rd, 2023. Miss Diane Johnson Pullum was a 1975 graduate of Southern University and A&M College with a bachelor's of science in education and was a member of the Southern University Alumni Federation and an ardent supporter and volunteer for special events at the university. She retired from Exxon Mobil as a site lead and more than 35 years of dedicated experience. She passed away on May 11th, 2023. <clears throat> Mr. Vida Rochelle Blue Jr. was a former American professional baseball player and a six-time All-Star. He was inducted into the Athletics Hall of Fame and the San Francisco Giants Wall of Fame. He was also involved in various charitable causes, such as mentoring young athletes and supporting cancer research. 
He passed away on May 8th, 2023. Mr. James L. Mahomes received his Bachelor of Science degree in Business Marketing and Management from Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He began work at the Southern University Agriculture Department. What began as a temporary position funded by grant later became a permanent position where he worked until he retired in December of 2022. His love for the university led him to serve in various local and national capacities as officers of the Southern University Alumni Federation. Mr. Mahomes saw himself as a part of the educational and spiritual continuum. He, will never, he never met a stranger and was always concerned with the welfare of others. He, is, he was well known for offering the helping anyone that, that he could help. He passed away on May 8, 2023. <clears throat> Mr. Ernest Sicky former chairman of the Cachada tribe of Louisiana and prominent Indian affairs advocate, passed away peacefully on May 17, 2023, at the age of 80. Mr. Sikki helped enlighten the non-Indian world about tribal sovereignty and self-determination. He led the Cachada tribe to be formally recognized by the state of Louisiana and the U.S. Department of Interior, which he achieved in 1972 and 1973, respectively. He later worked to create Louisiana State Office of Indian Affairs, for which he served as the first executive director. He was tribal chairman from 73 to 1985. His legacy includes transformative socioeconomic benefits to the Cachada tribe in southwest Louisiana. Lieutenant Colonel retired Carol J. Cayet, Sr., a U.S. Army veteran of World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam conflict. He was an alumnus of Southern University and earned bachelor's degrees in industrial education in 1951. Lieutenant Colonel Kayet joined the second class of the Reserve Officers Training Corps, ROTC, at Southern University and was commissioned second lieutenant upon graduation. Additionally, he was a member of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. A native of St. James Parish, he passed away on April 10th, 2023, at the age of 99. We are joined here today by his daughter, Mrs. Juanita Kaya Jolly, if she would please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that concludes our resolutions. Yes, Dr. Tyler. Last week, uh, a Miss Imani Williams was a sophomore on this campus, uh, was violently uh, killed in New Orleans, celebrating her birthday, uh, along with a, her best friend, who was a student at Nunes Community College. And I wanted to offer her name as a resolution and uh, sent to the, to the family. Uh, she lived in, the, I think, uh, in Tangipore Parish, uh, Ms. Ms. Smith. Uh, so would you add the name of Ms. Imani Williams, please? Thank you, Dr. Tar. Any other additions? Hearing that, uh, we'll uh, we have the motion on the floor, I imagine. All in favor, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item eight, number eight, informational items. A, update on Shreve uh, Memorial uh, Library, SULC. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, good morning. Um, a month ago, um, we um, had a fire. Uh, it started as a fire in the fourth floor of the Shreve Memorial Library where uh, the Southern University Law Center off-campus instructional site is occupying the third and fourth floor. That triggered uh, the um, system for uh, the big water, I call it water damage, the uh, uh, that system went off and there was water damage from the fourth floor down to the basement uh, at the Street Memorial Library. Um, and we have been working to uh, get all those things taken care of with respect to inventory of our losses, insurance. Uh, uh, I want to thank the president and uh, Mr. Gilliam and Dr. Tarver for uh, 
pushing some folks on some stuff because uh, the importance is that we've made a significant investment in those facilities and uh, we're going to have to go back and double that investment again. But we're driving uh, the insurers of the persons who caused this uh, this loss to get them to do what needs to be done so that we can protect our investment. So I just wanted to let the, the board know that. And, and of course, that's going to affect all the things we want to try to do with respect to Shreveport. It sets us back, but but we're we're working on it to to correct uh, whatever issues uh, exist and, and deal with that. Okay. Thank you, Chancellor. Item number uh, B, legislative update. Is Dr. Merrick, is she in the room? Okay. I'll let her lead this. I'll add my comments. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, am I controlling this or are you guys controlling it? I'm controlling it. Okay, great. Uh, just want to direct your attention to the screens for a moment as I go through our legislative update. Uh, just to share with you some images from SU Day at the Capitol, which was held on Monday of this week. And thank you all uh, for those of you that were able to participate with us. Uh, today actually marks the end of the sixth week of the nine week 2023 regular session of the Louisiana legislature. As you all know, this is a fiscal session uh, where legislators were allowed to file about five, up to five non-fiscal bills. And so we put forth our legislative agenda early this year, back in actually December. And so far the president has presented uh, before the House Appropriations, uh, Senate Finance and Senate Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Committees. Additionally, President Shields has met with several legislators, including the Speaker of the House, the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and this week, Higher Education was actually called back to testify before the Senate Finance Committee, where Dr. Vital represented us, uh, again, to address the proposed changes to House Bill 1, uh, which is our appropriations bill, and to begin discussions on the additional revenue that was announced by the Revenue Estimating Conference on yesterday that you heard the governor mention earlier. And so the governor went through a number of things that we are also tracking. Of course, he's met with the presidents and asked us to be very supportive of that effort to raise the spending cap for this legislative session. House Bill 2 is a number, another bill that we are tracking. That is our capital outlay bill. And you heard uh, Mr. Dawson speak on that. That bill is expected to be heard in the Senate Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Committee, I believe, this upcoming week. So we'll be watching that, of course, as well. There were about 885 bills that were filed this session. We are tracking actually 54 of those bills that are germane to higher education and anything about Southern in particular. We're also tracking those bills that um, are affecting medical marijuana. But uh, as I talked about just on the screen for you is uh, images from HBCU Day. I'm sorry, images actually from SU Day at the Capitol, but we also held HBCU Day on last month. And that was a collective effort of all of our state's public and private HBCUs. And that was led by the HBCU Advisory Council, which is housed at the Board of Regents. I do want to let you all know that there is a special exhibit, a new permanent exhibit at the Capitol Park Museum that features all of our HBCUs. And I'm really delighted to share that there is a, a very large a portion of that exhibit features Southern University. So if you are at the Capitol Park Museum, I would encourage you to visit. Uh, go to the second floor and you'll be able to see that entire space that is dedicated to the Southern system. So on uh, S SU Day at the Capitol, which was May 15th, this past Monday, and all of these photos are by our very own photographer, Mr. Ubri, uh, we did a special feature called Research in the Rotunda this year, which was different for us. This featured our students and faculty from throughout the Southern system. So all of our campuses were involved, including our lab school, uh, there with students and faculty to present research to legislators. And I've got sound effects, okay. So uh, the other thing is that we had lunch with the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus, now to reiterate our agenda and share with them at their uh, weekly meeting. We also had resolutions presented uh, for SU Day on the House floor and the Senate floor led by Representatives Barbara Carpenter and Senator Cleo Fields. 
And we had a reception that closed out the day and that was at the 121 downtown. I uh, do want to let you know that all of our campuses have been involved in our legislative efforts. We meet weekly. A representation from each of our campuses are, are there. And our campuses have also been meeting with their respective legislators and delegations uh, to advance the agenda for the university. We are also involved with the Southern Strategy, our lobbying group that works with us through the Southern Foundation. And we're very pleased to report that uh, we'll be working very diligently to secure some of our requests uh, in these last three weeks of the session. And Mr. President, I will turn the remainder over to you. Over into, I won't be doing a separate presidential report. <laughs> um, I, I wanna start by just mentioning one of the most inspiring moments uh, that I had with SU in uh, the Capitol were, were three young women from the biology department at SUNO who had all done health di disparities research and, and exp listening to them explain their research and what they learned from it and what their next ambitions are. So next year, we're gonna expand on this. Um, and I would urge board members, if you're able to come and interact with these young people, they will inspire you for the work that we do. Um, I think I scared them a little bit because I asked them, well, which one of you is going to be a medical doctor and which one's going to be a medical researcher? Uh, but that was the highlight of the day for me. That's my story. I will only change it if Senator Fields gets mad at me. Um, we, we have had two meetings with the governor where he's called the, the, the leadership of the systems into his office. And I will, would, uh, this is kind of a call to action. If we're going to do as well as we possibly can in this budget, we all need to be reaching out to all of the business and industry that we possibly can and get them to urge business and industry to support the, the ask that we have both as a system and what the Board of Regents have put forward. Um, so anything you can do to nudge any of your contacts along would be absolutely fabulous. Um, and he was quite stern. He was very pleasant this morning. But when he had us sitting there, he says, look, we this is really important because this may be the last bite at the apple uh, for some time. And so it's real important. I think Dr. Merrick has mentioned, I think our ask are probably in a pretty good place right now. And the state has the resources, but we need to keep pushing in every direction. I know Dr. Merrick and her team have been reaching out broadly. I will continue uh, my face-to-face -face meetings with as many people as possible. And if you have any suggestions as to business and industry people I'd be talking to directly, please share that with me. I, I got back, uh, I landed in New Orleans at 1 a.m. last night after spending the previous two days meeting with uh, either the, uh, each of the members of our federal de delegation or their staff to talk about the federal infrastructure uh, bill to uh, put in front of them and get their support for projects like the mega shelter, uh, several projects that the Ag Center and uh, 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 the Law Center have in front of them. Uh, and we got a warm reception. They, they like that we're there in front of them and we're gonna have to be building on that uh, effort at, at the federal level. There's, there's a lot of money there, a lot of money. So, um, I hope uh, those of you had the opportunity to attend uh, the commencements, uh, the, the great events. I've, I've been to three of them, and uh, I'm going to the law centers tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, this is a really exciting time of the year for the, the friends and families and, and, and the students. And let me offer, uh, I'm look, really looking forward to shaking the hand of uh, uh, board member Foster uh, as she graduates tomorrow. She thanked me for responding to her emails and tests. I said, that ends as soon as she's no longer on the board. <laughs> um, I'm open to any questions you might have. Oh, the last thing I want to say, uh, in the personnel, you, you, you approve the hire of, I think, um, a dynamic person, Desiree Honoré Thomas, uh, who I think will be a great addition to the leadership of the Baton Rouge campus and the system. And, uh, uh, will be a great 
team member for us. And I'm, I'm extraordinarily pleased that she'll be coming on board. And I thank you for her support of her uh, hiring. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Chancellor's report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, President Shields, uh, colleagues, well, the highlight uh, of my week last week was commencement. Uh, we had 325 graduates uh, from Southern University at New Orleans. And I wanna thank Chairman Lawson and Mrs. Lawson, as well as Mrs. Gaines uh, and the president uh, for being at commencement. Um, you know, as I <clears throat> spoke with some of the students as they walked across the stage, uh, there are some phenomenal stories from many of those graduates and all that they have gone through in order to walk across the stage and receive a diploma. Uh, it was truly a remarkable event. And uh, again, I just want to wish, again, wish all of them success as they go out into the world. Also, we were just informed by the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education that the nursing program, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing at uh, SUNO uh, has been scheduled for an evaluation visit uh, March 4th through the 6th, 2024. Uh, we are right on time in terms of not only the development of the program, but also the accreditation of the program. CCNE is one of the accrediting agencies for undergraduate nursing programs. And Ms. Smith, you will probably um, uh, uh, give us uh, congratulations on this along with other board members, but the College of Education received reaffirmation of accreditation by the Council for Accreditation of Education Preparation for a full term of seven years. Uh, this was just announced uh, day before yesterday. As you may notice, thank you, thank you. Well, again, you know, congratulations to uh, Dean Rose and the faculty. But one of the trends that I hope you all are seeing in the announcements of accreditation and reaffirmation of accreditation of the programs at Southern University at New Orleans is that all of them are receiving accreditation for a full term. Uh, social work, eight years, and now we have education for seven years. Thank you, that concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Chancellor, and I enjoyed the graduation. And until you see the faces, uh, board member uh, Gaines and I were, were talking about it, of those uh, first generation graduates go across this stage, you'll understand why they get so excited. And I was excited with them to see those students go across that stage, particularly with the challenges that many of them had. So kudos to you and the entire team over there. Dr. Penny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll give a very quick snapshot and there's a brief video, Mr. Chairman. You had asked uh, if I could provide that. So I that is right behind. A uh, quick snapshot, we have 342 graduates at our, at our spring 23 uh, commencement exercise. Uh, first, I want to thank the chairman, um, the Honorable Chairman Myron Lawson, for really leading the um, Southern University Board delegation. And he was ably assisted by uh, past chairman, Mr. Sam Gilliam. And uh, I thought the star of uh, the I'm board mistaken. at this particular graduation was none other than the Honorable Mrs. L. Dudley, who delivered the commencement address, and we thank you so much for that. Uh, 342 graduates. What was really neat is that this is a 20% increase over the number of uh, degrees that we awarded last spring. So we are putting out and helping drive the workforce in Northwest Louisiana. The other piece is that 17% of this graduating class were early college graduates or our duly enrolled students who cross the stage across six high schools, Dr. Tarver, across four parishes. And it was very nice to see those high school principals participate in the graduation. What was really cool even more was that you had these students who actually received their college credentials before their actual high school graduation programs were in place. So they were walking with some of them two college degrees before they even received their 
high school diplomas. Um, overall, um, out of the 342 credentials, 241 of them were associate degrees, 91 were certificates, seven were technical diplomas and ancillary degrees. And on that note, um, if they queue up the video, that'll wrap up my presentation. Thank Pay you. Attention. Does not fit. <laughs> it's not a <about> cap. <laughs> I am pleased to confer upon each and every one of you associate degrees, diplomas, certificates to which you are entitled together with all of the rights and the privileges thereto appertain. Congratulations, graduates. You will now turn your tassels from right to left. Yes, he did it. <laughs> he did do that. They give him a round of applause on it. it was, yeah. He did it. That's it. We're trying to we picked uh, the president off. Particularly <laughs> when they stomp across the stage. <laughs> but uh, I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Penning. Uh, this is his last month. We're going to recognize him more formally next month. But I certainly uh, believe he deserves a round of applause for what he's done. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a privilege to see those young people and mature people uh, cross the stage. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mac Means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed our uh, research uh, yesterday at the reception. Uh, our Sun Beef, and those of you who don't know what Sun Beef stands for, Southern University Natural, so it's all natural. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be brief. Um, I wasn't going to talk about the graduates, but uh, my colleagues are showing me up, so I, I have to definitely talk about commencement. It was definitely one of my, my favorite commencements. Um, we had 43 uh, graduates out of the College of Agriculture, and it was really nice to talk to all of them, and they have plans going forward. In fact, one of them, and President Shields was there when it happened, one of the individuals got hired on the spot by the Secretary of Agriculture. So uh, we, we have all those individuals even going to USDA, industry, graduate school, continuing at uh, Southern University College of Ag, or uh, one of of uh, the students actually going into education. She's teaching K through 12. She wants to teach people agriculture. And then we also have some uh, uh, others that are, of course, most of them are going to end up at USDA. So we're proud of our graduates uh, and they've done an outstanding job. And uh, uh, I ask each of them to stay in touch, uh, but I always encourage them to go on for further education. Uh, and, and so uh, hopefully most of them will. Uh, the The Second item and last item is related to our cooperative extension program uh, under the auspices of the uh, Southern University Ag Center held this 18th annual business development and procurement conference and uh, May 15th through uh, the 18th this week. And uh, normally this activity would be on campus, um, but it has outgrown, outgrown campus. Um, and we actually had it at LaBerge, and I, I want to uh, let you guys know that was my first time at that casino. It's very nice. That's a very nice casino. Uh, and we also had an international presence, and this year was 825 participants. And this is by far the largest, and we're expecting it to grow even more. And, I'm, I'm, and we had 40 sessions, and so I'm just excited. Uh, uh, our, our own uh, Ted, Ted James was there uh, supporting us 
as far as small and minority businesses. And as a as an 1890 land grant institution, we have a mission mandate to serve underserved and underrepresented communities. And so this particular function puts us in a position to continue with our mission that started back in 1880 to serve those types of communities. So we're excited about that. So next year, as it grows, we hope hopefully some of you will be a part of that. So uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Chancellor of the Law Center. Yes, sir. Again, thanks every, to everyone for the votes that you casted today. Uh, allows us to keep moving forward. May 20th is a big day in the life of Southern University Law Center. Commencement, we will have 200 graduates. Uh, and I think officially that's the largest class to, to graduate from the Southern University Law Center. So we look forward to seeing as many of you as can be with us tomorrow at 10 a.m. And uh, we want to, uh, again, thank the board for all of the support given to us. Thank you. So, uh, Chancellor, uh, I want to mention to the board that a very distinguished uh, member of the or, or native of Louisiana will be a guest because I think her niece is graduating from law school, perhaps during um, the election of the Speaker of the House this year. You saw this very dramatic and powerful woman pounding the gavel and keeping things in order. That's uh, Cheryl Johnson, a native of New Orleans, um, who will be attending graduation tomorrow. I'd be happy to introduce you uh, to any of to any of you who are, are present, but we're very pleased to have her. Yeah, and, and the speaker tomorrow will be uh, United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal Judge Dana Davis, and she is the first African-American woman to be uh, not nominated and selected as a circuit court judge in the Fifth Circuit. Douglas, I said Davis, Douglas, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Chancellor uh, Pierre. Uh, Chancellor Sahu. Provost. <laughs> thank, I'm promoting you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you for the promotion. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Provost. <laughs> yes, sir. Right, Mr. Folks. Chairman, uh, Mr. President, and honorable members of the board, I'll be brief. I also would like to highlight uh, the commencement ceremony that uh, took place last week. And uh, many of you were there. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your presence. Um, as the flagship you know, campus of this uh, system, I think we are doing our part and doing it well. We graduated over 600 students. And each of these students, please be assured, will go on to have productive careers, be, will be leaders in the community by living noble lives, and will be global citizens. The rest of my report is in the chancellor's report that is provided to you. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sahu. Okay, I think that completes uh, our uh, updates and informational items. Uh, before I go to the next item, I want to say that uh, I'm going to say that we're going to just discuss the instrument and some other things on the president's evaluation that's uh, upcoming. You can stay if you'd like, but there's no need for folk in the room to stay. Uh, we're going to come out, and we're not going to discuss anything we discussed. Uh, not that you'd want to hear it anyway. Uh, so give us an opportunity to go back here if the body decides to go back there. And we're probably not going to be very long, but I wanted to give folk, particularly those that may be traveling, the opportunity to go home. And that includes uh, chancellors and vice chancellors, if you're okay with that, uh, Mr. President. Sure. Okay, with that, I'll uh, go to item E, presidential evaluation. Okay, before we go there. Uh, I heard you say that next month we're going to recognize. Uh, yes, we're going to recognize. Absolutely. Would, would you please consider putting our past board members in that? We've not recognized them at all. We actually uh, have it scheduled to start recognizing, gave them the option to uh, come either to a meeting here our meeting in New Orleans. Yeah, okay. So thank you for that right, uh, you. observation. Okay. Uh, 
and one last thing before we take the motion, I would also like to congratulate, and I waited to the end, uh, our dear colleague on her graduating. And I want to be there and share that moment. We talk late at night, and it's always about the students, always about the students. And I doubt, I don't have any doubt she's going to do exceptionally well in the writing part of the exam because she can write. <laughs> she's very, very talented, and she's not afraid to represent. And I, I, I know that we will have that lighting project by next month board meeting. Uh, Mr. Dawson was kind of uh, cautious as he should be, but I feel very comfortable we will have those funds and will be a significant amount. So that's going to be a tribute to what you've done that people have been talking about that for years. So for that, I want to congratulate our dear colleague uh, for uh, the ambitious uh, steps she's making, and I know she's going to be successful. I also wanted to commend our colleague, uh, Zazelle Dudley, as uh, the chancellor said, she did a phenomenal job. Uh, the gazelle gets up in the morning to outrun the lion, and the lion gets up in the morning to catch the gazelle. <laughs> gazelle, I said gazelle. So that was the message. We got to keep running is the message, and uh, that was very empowering. And I also would like uh, to thank some wonderful board members in addition to her, and she's including that number that uh, – Passed their confirmation test starting to my left. Uh, our colleague, uh, board member Maple Gaines. Then we're coming further over, board member Paul Matthews. Board member, uh, let me see, I'm going to go on the end here before I get to her. I'm missing anybody. Uh, Christy Reeves and Zazelle. We say Zazelle. And board member Ann Smith. And I want to say these two wonderful young ladies because Many people didn't realize they had to get reappointed. So uh, let's give them a round of applause because <laughs> it's ambitious. It's ambitious enough to get this appointment. The governor shares with me oftentimes. This is one of the most sought after boards uh, in the state of Louisiana. So to get on here is very, very phenomenal uh, opportunity. But to get reappointed is, is extraordinary. So thank you all. And with that being said, I'll entertain a motion for E. Okay, well, one more. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Motion. I have a motion for board uh, number E, presidential evaluation. Is there a second to the motion? Okay. I'm going to read this. Uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors of the Southern University in Agriculture and Mechanical College may meet in executive session to discuss personnel matters under the provision of Louisiana Revised Statute 42, uh, semicolon uh, 17. Discussions regarding evaluation of the uh, president section 8 of the agenda is such a matter. While in an executive session, the board may meet with his uh, staff attorneys, his staff, or other persons as deems necessary. No motions may be taken while in an executive session. Is there a motion to go in an executive session? Another motion by board member Reeves, probably second by board member Dudley. Roll call. Uh, Myron K. Lawson, chair. Yes. Dr. Ro uh, Ronnie Whitfield, vice chair. Attorney Jody Amadi, Ms. Zazel Dudley, Mr. Raymond Fondell Jr., Ms. Nadia Foster, Mrs. Maple Gaines, Mr. Sam Gilliam, Mr. Paul Matthews, Mrs. Christy Reeves, Attorney Des Moines Rutledge, Attorney Edwin Shorty, Mrs. Ann A. Smith, Dr. Leon R. Tarver II, Reverend Dr. Samuel Tolbert, Dr. Orlando Williams.
Okay. We have a motion that uh, we come out of the executive session, properly second. While in executive session, the board discussed preliminary evaluation of the uh, pre president chancellor. While in executive session, no motions were made or votes taken. We already have the motion to come out of executive session, been properly second. Roll call. Mr. Myron K. Lawson, chair. Yes. Dr. Rainey, Rainey Whitfield, vice chair. Attorney Jody Amade. Ms. Zazel Dudley. Mr. Raymond Fondell, Jr. Ms. Nadia Foster. Present. Mrs. Maple Gaines. Present. Mr. Sam Gilliam. Yes. Mr. Paul Matthews. Yes. Mrs. Christy Reeves. Attorney Des Moines Rutledge. Attorney Edwin Shorty. Present. Ms. Ann A. Smith. Yes. Dr. Okay. Leon R. Tarver II. Reverend Dr. Samuel Tolbert. Dr. Orlando Williams. Yeah, you give me a chance to say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, we have a quorum. Okay, we will now out of uh, executive session item number nine. Is there any other business that needs to come before uh, the Southern University Board of Supervisors? Y'all want Dr. Sahu to deliberate about his budget from A to Z? No? Okay, the motion adjourned. All right. <laughs>